Where were you 40 years ago today? For some of you, that's not much of a problem. You weren't born yet. I understand that. Uh, let me let me see a show of hands. How many of you are under are 40 years of age or under? Okay. Now another show of hands. How many people here are under 60 years of age? Now here's something you should know: that if we had been with Moses at that crucial moment in the desert of Paran. Those of you who just raised your hands would be the ones that went into the promised land. The rest of us would have died in the desert. It's the way it came out, as a matter of fact. I remember where I was 40 years ago today. I was at a Feast of Tabernacles in South Africa. But that's because I was keeping the feast. Otherwise, I don't know if I'd have a clue. The important, this is really important because it has a strong relationship with this festival. In Leviticus 23, verse 39, it says this. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you've gotten all the fruit of the land in, you shall keep a feast of the Lord for seven days. You shall dwell in tabernacles for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in tabernacles, that your generation may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in tabernacles when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Israel were campers all the way from Egypt to the Jordan River. But it turned out they were out there a lot longer than they had to be. They were out there for 40 long years. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons over the years about the Feast of Tabernacles. I've heard that it looks forward to the millennium and the kingdom of God. I've heard that it pictures our, and I preach myself, it pictures our own wilderness wanderings. In the time that we are in the desert of this world, we're temporary, we're living in tents, and we're looking for a city. All of that I've heard. I haven't heard so much about the reason why it came about the way it did, nor the implications of that for each of us in our relationship with God and the way we live our life. I want to tell a story, but before I can, I have to take you back to a moment before the giving of the Ten Commandments. And it's in Exodus chapter 19, where God speaks to Israel and says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings, how I brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. I, you know, to think that God would speak and say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a covenant. You keep covenant with me, and you will be a peculiar treasure to me above all people. It almost makes me ache to think about what that means. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words, he said, you'll speak to the children of Israel. So he called all the elders of the people together. He laid before their faces all the words that God had commanded him. They heard all this. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people to God. Lesson number one. Don't make a commitment to God that you are not prepared to carry out. It's what Jesus was driving at when he told his disciples, Count the cost. If any man comes to me and hates not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, his own life also, he said in Luke 14, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross... And come after me, cannot be his, my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, doesn't sit down first and count the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Don't make commitments to God you're not prepared to carry out. So likewise, whoever he be of you who forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Now we're prepared to tell the story. Israel came to a place in the desert just south of Palestine, just south of the land that they were supposed to go in 
conquer, and occupy. Let's call it Camp Crisis. The reason I give it that name is because a crisis is an unstable or crucial time or state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending. It's that moment when something is going to happen that will change everything that comes after it in a crucial way. So I name this place Camp Crisis. And as they were camped there, the Lord spoke to Moses saying this. This is in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. Numbers 13, verse 1. Send men that they may search out the land of Canaan that I gave to the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them out from the wilderness of Paran. All these men were heads of the children of Israel. Now, mind you, these are not just expendable scouts. These are heads of tribes. They deserve to have their names read before you. They were of the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, of the tribe of Issachar, Egal, of the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea, who is called Joshua, of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel. What a group. Of the tribe of Asher, Sethur, of the tribe of Naphtali, Navi, of the tribe of Gad, Guel. Those are the names of the men that Moses sent to spy out the land. And he called the name of Oshia, the son of Nun, Joshua. Now, I think it's important to read out their names because they play such a pivotal role in the events to follow. Moses saw fit to record every one of them for posterity so we would know who they are, who their family was, where they fit in the scheme of things. They were powerful men. They were leaders of tribes. They were opinion leaders. They were men whose, whose opinions and ideas were respected by the people. And they underlined the importance of leadership among any people at any time. Two in particular, Joshua, an Ephraimite, and Caleb, a Jew, were the true core of this group. Well, they returned, Numbers 13, verse 25, from searching out the land after 40 days. They came to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation of Israel, to give their report. They showed them the fruit of the land, and they showed, said, We came into the land where you sent us, and surely... It is a land that flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. God had not let them down. They had not been misled to. They had not lied to. The land was indeed a land of milk and honey. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. So they began then to detail in front of the people all of the problems, all of the downside, all of the enemies, the power of the enemy, the fact that there were giants in the land of, those, of that time, the, the children of Anak, who were apparently huge. The people were noticeably, observably, understandably concerned. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let's go up right now and possess this land, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go against those people. They are stronger than we are. The leadership lacked nerve. They were afraid, and they responded to their fear with cowardice, for I can call it nothing else. They brought up an evil report of the land that they had searched to the children of Israel and said, The land through which we have gone to search it eats up the inhabitants thereof. It's a hard place. And all the people we saw there were big men. And we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, and we were in their sight and in our sight like so many grasshoppers. And the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and they wept all that night. You know, it's hard to imagine what a crushing blow to the people this report was. Because they believed the men. 
They believed the men that came back and brought this report. I mean, Caleb and Joshua would have wanted to go, but they were outnumbered ten to two. And they, as I say, these were not just ordinary men that led them. They were the leaders of the tribes, the patriarchs, men they had looked to all their lives. How could they turn away from these? Their hopes were dashed. Everything they dreamed about going to the promised land was just gone. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the desert? Lesson. Don't over-dramatize your situation. Don't sit there and say, oh, I wish I'd died in the desert, because that's precisely what they got. You want to die in the desert? Fine. You will die in the desert. Why has the Lord brought us up into this land they wanted? To fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Wouldn't it be better to go back to Egypt at this point? And they said to one another, let's make a captain and go back to Egypt. Two men understood the gravity of what they had just done, Moses and Aaron, and they fell flat on their faces in front of the whole congregation. And Joshua, the son of Nun, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were with them, have searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spoke to all the company, saying, Look, it's a good land. If the Lord delight in us, he'll take us in and give it to us. <clears throat> Only rebel not against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. They are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with them. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Two powerful leaders, men of faith, they wanted to kill them and get them out of the way. About that time, the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation right there before all the children of of Israel. I expect it would have scared the daylights out of some people, and maybe it didn't all. <clears throat> Numbers 14, verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, How long are these people going to provoke me? How long will it be before they will believe me for all of the signs I have wrought among them? Remember now, these were people who walked dry shod across the bottom of the Red Sea with water like a wall on the right hand and on the left hand. And he says, What is it going to take? I know what I'll do. I'm just going to smite them all with a pestilence, disinherit them, and make a greater nation and a mightier nation out of you, Moses. Now, Moses is a remarkable man. And the speech he makes at this point is decisive. It shows him as a man of incredible character and wisdom in what he said to do. And every Israelite who lived or ever would live again owed his very existence to this man and the prayer that he made to God on this occasion, having gone through all of his reasons that he had given as to why God shouldn't do this, he said, Pardon, I pray you, the iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of your mercy, as you have forgiven this people from Egypt all the way to this point. It's happened once and again. He's done it again and again and again. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. It didn't come out of the blue sky. It wouldn't have happened except for Moses, I have pardoned according to your word. But as truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men who have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times and just wouldn't listen, surely they will not see the land that I swore to their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. They're just all going to die in the desert. But my servant Caleb, now, now there's a man with a different spirit. Talking about something here that people can have one kind of a spirit and are another kind of a spirit. There are those who are dominated by a spirit of fear and timidity. And there are those who are dominated by a spirit of boldness and are prepared to be bold in the face of adversity. And Caleb was indeed such a man. He said he had another spirit. It's not going to happen to him or to Joshua. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, verse 26, saying, How long am I going to bear with this evil congregation? 
I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel that they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, exactly as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses will fall in this desert, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, that's where we got the 60, all those people who have murmured against me are going to die out here in the desert. Doubtless you will not come into the land that I swore to let you dwell in, except for Caleb and Joshua. But your little ones, whom you said would be a prey, them will I bring in, and they will know the land. The kids would be the ones, the generation that would possess the land. Kind of an, so many interesting ideas that come out of that. And the realization that sometimes the older generation have lost their nerve. And it's going to be left to the younger generation. Be up against the wall and have to face it. And who will have what it takes to get it done? You people, you will fall in the wilderness and your children shall wander in the wilderness for 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses are wasted in the desert. You know, it's a funny thing. That word whoredoms coming in here basically means marital infidelity. And I think what he's talking about at this point is we made that covenant, remember? I told you you would be a peculiar treasure to me, as every man's wife should be to him. And you said, all you command me I will do. Where did this go? Because it's gone. The promise is gone. The faithfulness is gone. And because of it, you're finished. Israel made a promise and went back on their word. After the number of the days you searched out the land, even forty days... Each day for a year, so shall you bear your iniquities forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. You will know what it means to break your word with me. And so it went that all the evil men who brought up the bad plague died. They died of the plague before God, except Joshua and Caleb. And Moses told all these sayings to the children of Israel. And the people mourned greatly. They rose up early in the morning. They said, okay, okay, we were wrong. Let's get together and let's go up and let's start this fight right now. Moses says, don't go. They went anyway. And the Amalekites nearly wiped them out. They lost. They suffered a crushing defeat. The lesson. There is a point of no return. There is a place, after you have made your stupid mistake, that you have to accept the judgment of God and live it out. You've got to keep on feeding the children out there in the desert. You've got to keep on pitching your tent at every new location. You've got to keep on trying to keep body and soul together and family together because in your family you are making the investment in the next generation. When God has judged you, you accept his judgment, pray for his mercy, but don't try to take the mountain when he has told you, give it up. Now, I want to pause here for just a moment and talk about a word that entered into this discussion that I don't think we fully understand. The word is rebellion. And I've heard this word abused in any number of ways. There is something about it at its core. I mean, there, there's, there, as I say, you know, the, the Israelites were a rebellious lot. They were rebellion. And rebel come up again and again in discussions of them, but there's something you need to know about this. At its core, rebellion is a self-centered, know-it-all, fractious state of mind. The one person holds his own opinion above the common good and above the common wisdom. He is not prepared to place himself second. He is not prepared to submit himself to the decisions of the community of faith, if we're talking about a church. And this is true whether it is strongly led, as in the case of Moses, or whether it is congregational and democratic. The rebel is the person who holds his own judgment above that of the collective wisdom and the collective decisions of the community. None of this, by the way, has anything to do with what you hold in your mind in terms of your belief. No one can tell you what to think. No one can tell you what to believe. What we're talking about here is what you 
do. If your church, your community, has adopted a particular version of the Hebrew calendar, you should keep to that. Even though in your heart of hearts you believe they're wrong. Even though you think maybe there's a better calendar that fits the Bible better. The fact is that the community has decided this is the calendar we're going to use to decide to set your own opinion above everybody else's is to be a rebel. Not so much that you believe. That's okay. The question is, are you going to do? That is, are you going to show up on Passover with everybody else and wash the feet of your brethren and share the bread and wine that is there on that occasion before God and renew the covenant with your community? Are you going to charge off on your own and do your own thing somewhere? It has to do very much, this does, with humility. And the phrase, I may be wrong. Whenever you forget that, when you start being gripped with an overwhelming amount of certainty about your own opinions and what you think, you're headed for nothing but trouble. I may be wrong should precede statements of opinion. And what if you split your church over an issue and it turns out you were wrong? Not possible? Well, if you think you're, it's not possible that you might be wrong, I'm not talking to you. I have told you all that to tell you this. This is where I've been going the whole time. At some point in the months and years ahead, you're going to find yourself at Camp Crisis. You're going to be right there where there's a crucial point where decisions are going to be made that are going to affect your life from that point on. Because generally speaking, once you come to a fork in the road and you take one of them, there is not going to be any turning back. At some point, you will be there. You will have assimilated all the data that's available. You will wish you had more data. Wishing won't help. You will have to act on what you've got. That requires faith. Not acting won't help. And this is one of the things probably where we make our biggest mistake and our most frequent mistake. We think that not acting is avoiding the decision or putting off the decision. We don't realize that not acting is a decision. And it is the only decision you make which really has no hope of being right. Generally speaking, if you make up your mind, you got a 50-50 shot. You may be right. You may be wrong. Not acting will not help. In, as, it, there is, by the way, one constant at Camp Crisis. It's fear. It's always there. If there were no fear, there would be no crisis. There is nothing wrong with fear. But there are two possible responses to fear. One is timidity. In its extreme form, it's cowardice. And the other is courage. That's all that's available to you at that point. To be afraid is not to be timid or a coward. Not at all. It's what you do that makes the difference. Now, how will you know that you have arrived at camp crisis in your life? You'll face a decision, and you'll know fear. Those two things are there. And you've probably been there before. You've been there before, and sometimes in varying degrees. In our life, we're like wanderers, and we pass through camp crisis, and we go on down the road, and the first thing we know, we're back there again on something else. Your, let's take it for example. Let's say your current job is not working where you work, and it challenges your faith in important ways. Changing jobs is a prospect that tends to make us fearful. We get awfully used to that salary check coming in every, every couple of weeks. We get awfully comfortable in the benefits that we've got. We get awfully comfortable if we've got, well, I've got a retirement fund, I've got a 401K, I've got a health plan, but I hate this job. And also, it's challenging my faith. What this does is it immobilizes you. We postpone the decision, thinking if we don't make a decision, we are okay. But that doesn't work. You just live in camp crisis that way. The advice that anyone should have is do something. Explore the possibilities, and whatever you do, there's an old saying, you may have heard it, never take counsel of your fears. What that means is when you're looking around for advice, the one place you don't want to listen to the advice 
is your fears. Don't listen to it. Don't let them tie you up. Feel free to run it. I'm sorry, I, I slipped a point here on what it is I was trying to say. Don't let that happen to you. And somehow or other, I let something happen to me. I'm at Camp Crisis. As I said, don't take counsel of your fears. But there are other ways in which you will encounter crises. Five little Amish girls face a terrible crisis in that schoolhouse. They were at Camp Crisis. Sometimes Camp Crisis involves life or death. And that is a very frightening prospect. The question is, what do you do when you find yourself in that circumstance? Do you freeze? Do you do nothing? Do you do as you're told? What do you do at a moment like that? The funny thing about it is you, you think that because someone has a gun that you can't do anything. That's a big mistake. That's a terrible mistake. Now, I realize the Amish are a pacifist people. And about pacifism, I can say this. Pacifism is correct if we're talking about aggressive behavior. It's not correct if you're talking about defensive behavior. Those girls, because of their upbringing, because of the way they have, you know, their whole family life and everything else and the way they are protected, could not even conceive of Anything other than allowing that man to do what he wanted to do. But they faced a decision. You may think they didn't have a choice, but they did have choices to make. They could, for example, have not allowed the man to tie them up. You consider the problem of trying to tie up five girls, young teens, perhaps. It's no simple matter to tie up somebody in the first place, and it's sure no simple matter to tie them up if they're resisting being tied up. And while he is struggling with one girl to tie her up, what are the others doing? Now, I'm not blaming those girls. I understand that. What I'm doing is I'm talking to you, not the girls. You don't have to stand there and do nothing while a man ties you and other people up with a view to doing you harm later on. Now, I know what crosses your mind, what would cross your mind at that time. Well, I may die. Does it occur to you at that time to think, I may die anyway? And which way would you rather die? Tied up and trust or fighting for your life? I think you're better to fight. Don't let them tie you up. Feel free to run and dodge. You'll be harder to hit than you would ever imagine. Most people who have guns in their hands really aren't that good at it. And the accuracy of a handgun, if you're over 15 to 20 feet, well, you know, you have to be pretty good to keep your shots where you want them to go. You can run. You can dive out the window. And while one girl is struggling to keep him from tying her up, you can be gone out the door quickly. you got a choice. You have choices at every step of the way, even when you think you don't. And you need to also understand that intimidation is a tool of cowards. And a man who shows up in a school with a gun and some little girls is yellow to the core. You need to remember that. The man is a coward or he wouldn't be there with the gun. And that can inform the kind of decisions that you're going to make. Dr. Laura advised one of her callers to send her kids to karate class. In this day of increasing violence, that makes a lot of sense. It isn't just that you're going to fight somebody. It creates confidence, and it can serve a kid well in camp crisis no matter what the crisis is. Now, in most cases, your crisis will not be mortal danger. But the fundamental principles are the same. Don't let yourself be intimidated by anyone, and not even by a gun. Two, don't postpone the moment of decision. 
Do it now. The quicker you do it, the more likely you will be to be successful. The third point, don't let fear paralyze you. You will have to act, and you can't afford to let fear stop you from acting. Don't think that in not making a decision, you are leaving a matter in God's hands. This is extremely important. Don't think that in not making a decision, you are leaving this in God's hands. Because what makes you so sure that God has not placed the decision in your hands? Because the Israelites had a choice. They could do what God said and go up the mountain, or they could say, well, let's make a captain and go back to Egypt. You've got to take the matter in your hands. To me, this is one of the most fundamental things to know about God. He is not in the business of pulling all your levers and pushing all your buttons for you. He wants sons and daughters who will make decisions and act on them. I've passed through Camp Crisis more than once in my life. In fact, we're old friends. I know the location well. The most notable example for me was 30 years ago. I was faced with the decision of resigning from a position and a relationship that has shaped my entire life. Well paid, well secured, well respected, at home, comfortable, but I couldn't support the administration. I fasted. I prayed. I asked God to show me what to do. I was hoping that they would fire me so I wouldn't have to decide. God did not let them fire me. I asked him to show me what to do, and one day he did. What he showed me was that he had given me all the data I needed. What he wanted from me was a decision, and that the decision was mine. This is something you've got to get through your head. You sit around waiting for God to do it all for you. You're liable to stay at Camp Crisis the rest of your life or die in the desert. I made the decision, and I never looked back. It was the first of many steps that brought me to where I am today, pure and simple. Now, finally, there is this. In Revelation 21, there is this vision that John is having in which the angel or the messenger of God said to him, or actually it was Christ who said it to him, it's done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Revelation 21, verse 6. I will give to him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of the life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Did you catch that? It's the winners who inherit. That's what overcoming means. You face the obstacle. You stand there in camp crisis, and you overcome your fear, and you act. He that overcomes, he who wins, shall inherit all things. Then there follows this terrible list of those who won't overcome. Guess what heads the list? The fearful and the unbelieving. We need to train ourselves to win. You know where we do that? We do it at Camp Crisis. Every time we come there, every time we face this, every time we meet our fears and act on what we need to do, we start learning how to win. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to die in the desert because I believe we were born to win. 